Oh, hello, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a um, great pleasure to be able to talk to you this evening and um, also with uh, some two thirds existing City London shareholders. Um, I'll talk a bit about the background of the trust, um, how I manage the portfolio, and then move on to talk about um, how I'm seeing the market at the moment and how the portfolio is positioned. So if we move on to the first slide. Um, so as, as most of you will know, City of London's objective is to produce total return, both, both capital growth and income growth. And we are particularly um, proud of our income record with the longest track record of dividend growth of annual increases of any investment trust. And I'll talk about that and how we've achieved that. Um, one of the great features of investment trust is that you have an independent board of directors um, to look after shareholders' interests. We, we, our current board is um, five people, three men and two women. And our chairman is uh, Sir Laurie Magnus, who's had a long distinguished career in corporate finance. He's still an advisor with Evercore, but if you recognize the name, he was appointed um, by the Prime Minister as his independent ethics advisor last December and was immediately busy with that case of the Conservative Party chairman who um, was in, had a dispute with HMRC. So he's um, been kept busy with that, but he's, he's certainly um, got a lot of time uh, to be chairman of our board, which he does very well. Uh, we're actually the biggest uh, investment trust in UK equity income sector. We've got slightly over two billion of, of assets and um, we've been very popular over the last 10 years. We've issued a lot of shares because we've been trading consistently at a premium to net asset value. So when you trade at a premium by issuing shares at that level, you enhance NAV. And so we've increased our share capital by almost um, by around 92 percent over the last 10 years. Um, but when we did fall to a small discount um, back in September 2020, uh, we bought in shares at a 2% discount. That was just before the vaccines were announced. So um, it was kind of weak point in the market, but it, typically we've been issuing shares on a 2% premium and buying them back on a 2% discount. Next slide, please. So I've been manager of the trust for an awful long time, since 1991, uh, and it's been a huge privilege to have done so. And um, I can't think of um, anything better to, to do in fund management. Um, I have a deputy fund manager, David Smith, I've worked with for 10 years. He's actually been formally deputy of the trust since um, for about the last two years. Um, I talked about the independent board. One of the advantages you've got there is they negotiate the management fee. So we have a particularly low management fee, 0.325%, which is one of the lowest of any investment trust and, and way lower than um, you find in an open-ended fund. So our overall ongoing charge is 0.37%, which is the lowest in our, our sector. And another feature investment trust is we can issue debt and we've taken advantage in recent years, as you know, interest rates have been extraordinarily low and we've locked in some really cheap long term debt. So we were borrowing 30 million pounds for uh, out to 2046 at 2.67% and 50 million at 2.94% out to 2049. And when you look what guilt yields have done subsequently, I mean, the government is now kind of borrowing it over, you know, about 4.3, 4.5%. Uh, you know, the, these were definitely well-timed deals and it locks in very cheap financing for our shareholders for the next quarter of a century. Next slide. So David and I work in the Janice Henderson Global Equity Income team. Uh, you know, we were a great team. A lot of us have worked together for, for many years. I'm actually the oldest member of the team. I'm going to be 62 at the end of, on the end of this in about a week's time. Um, but I'm in very good company because James Henderson, Will be 62 at the beginning of July, so we're we're, we're both the um, veterans in, in the in the um, team, and we've got the advantage of um, having kind of been around the track a few times. But you know, we got colleagues who are mid career or um, those in the early part of their career who obviously are much closer to trends in society, etc. So um, it's a good mix, and um, you know, we work extremely well together. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll talk a bit about my investment philosophy and. Um, I, I'm a sort of valuation driven investor. I mean, some people only focus on growth. Uh, I mean, I, for me, you know, it, you got to combine it with the kind of share price valuation. I mean, how good a company it is, um, if it gets overvalued, it can lead to disappointing share price performance, particularly if the company doesn't quite meet expectations. And, you know, I invested back in the mid 2000s in companies like Spark, Sack, Sarko, Halma, and Renishaw, and they did extraordinarily well, went up more than 10 times, and I sold out of them in 2021, um, even though they're a good company, simply because the valuations were too excessive. And you know, I was able to recycle into a company like BA Systems, our big defense contractor, which I'd already held, I, I made additions, and um, which looked very cheap. And um, 
and, and has performed well subsequently. And it's sad it took a war in Ukraine to prove um, you know what a good company it is, but it's, um, it's it's had a much better share price recognition. So, you know, value, share price valuation is what ultimately determines return for me. Um, I mean, values growth has been predominant in markets in recent years, but um, value in the long run has worked well, and um, it had a particularly good year in the more turbulent market conditions last year. Um, I mean, dividend yields where I start with, but I'm, I want to be in companies that have got long-term growth. So. Um, without long-term growth, you're not going to get the dividend growth. So you need to have long-term growth and profits and companies investing enough for the future. Uh, so, but I look at a whole range of um, share price valuations. And the other part of my style is I'm a pretty conservative character and that's reflected in, in the portfolio. So I like companies with strong balance sheets. They're best able to carry on paying dividends in a downturn. I like cash generation. Um, you need that to support both the dividends and the necessary capital expenditure. So. Uh, so this this um, approach is more about kind of clocking up singles and twos rather than sort of trying to hit the ball out of the ground and score sixes. It's probably one way of, of kind of picturing it. Um, I have a kind of chart of, you know, how of uh, kind of how the process goes, but I sort of begin with um, looking at kind of value snapshots. Um, then I do the individual analysis of stocks helped by my team at Janice Henderson. And also we have a, a we have analysts across the globe who, who cover the companies in a lot of detail. But I'm looking at the downside risk as well as the upside potential. And then the support portfolio construction, which um, where I'm looking at the overall kind of income tilt of the portfolio. I and mean, I'd like to see a above average yield, but growth, mixture of above average yield and growth. But I, within the portfolio, there'll be some lower yielders as well as some, some higher yielders and stocks in the middle of the ground. And I'm also considering the macro factors. Next slide. And next slide. So how's this translated into performance? Well, this shows you the performance going back the whole of my time managing City of London from 1st of July 91. And, and we are comfortably ahead of the index, as you can see, um, uh, over that whole period. Our best performance tends to be in defensive markets. Um, you know, last year we had a good, very good year um, with the problems, you know, triggered by the Ukraine war and rising interest rates. So, um, and at the moment we're ahead of the, um, FTSE All Share, which is the index um, we're compared with um, over one, three, five, and ten years, as well as um, as well as over the very long term, thirty-two years since I've been managing the trust, and we're well ahead of the um, OIC sector over all periods. Against the investment trust sector, we're marginally behind over one and ten years, but we're ahead over um, uh, over um, three and five years. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So let's turn to the income record and. Um, we have the longest um, record of any investment trust, um, 56 years of consecutive increase. And we've just really announced our uh, dividend for, for the next year, um, which will be an, uh, another increase of 2.6%, which has been announced, hasn't yet been um, gone ex-dividend. Um, so how have we achieved it? Well, you know, we've needed a consistent base of companies, but we also have used the investment trust structure whereby you can use revenue reserves. And in the table, you can see that if you go back into that first year of the pandemic, when there were a huge amount of dividend cuts across the market, something like 36% dividend decline in the FTSE 100, more outside. And in that period, we actually paid out 21% more than we earned. Uh, and we were able to draw on our revenue reserve in, in that year, whilst um, uh, whilst the next year, we, we, we still had to pay out our reserves by 11%, 11.8%. Uh, but then last year, we're, by the way, at 30th junior financial year end, we actually were able to put money back into reserves. So we, we paid out 94.6% and the other 5.4% went back into our revenue reserves. So, you know, without the revenue reserve, we would not have been able to achieve that very long term uh, dividend track record. And I think that revenue reserve per share of 9.5p, which is almost half the um, total annual dividend cost is, is um, gives should give shareholders a lot of comfort that we can continue with that record going forward. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, so that's a chart showing you the dividend growth right from the very beginning. You have to be quite old to have um, owned the shares all that time, but it just shows you how it compounds up. And I think another part of the secret of, of, of it is not having your eggs in one basket. And this just shows you where our income comes from, for, uh, you know, from the different industries we're invested in. And you see our biggest single sector is actually consumer staples. But um, outside of that, you know, we it, it's a pretty, which are kind of everyday, comes to me, everyday goods, uh, which people consistently buy. But outside of that, it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty good spread across different, so we're not kind of hostage to any one 
sector turning down. Next slide, please. And next one. Uh, so I'm now going to turn on to talk a bit more about the the market and um, how how um, you know how the trust is positioned. And this chart shows you how much the UK has underperformed um, the the world index. The top line is the world index, excluding the UK, and then the bottom line is the UK. And I have to say these these charts begin to diverge a bit at the time of the Brexit referendum in 2016, which admittedly whatever we thought about in the UK wasn't wasn't taken very well. In global uh, by global investors, um, but I think part the main reason for the divergence is really that the world index is dominated by the American market, which is again dominated by the big technology companies, and there's no real equivalent of those in the UK market. So, you know, that said, so fair enough, they've done very well, and that explains a big chunk of the performance of the world index. But actually, even if you strip that out and look at comparable companies, you look at say Exxon, the big American oil company with Shell, there's a huge uh, Different in, in share valuation, or if you consider BA Tobacco with Philip Morris, the same. And overall, we estimate on a like for like basis, the UK is some 20% cheaper than that than equivalents overseas, and um, as, a, as a rule. So, um, and I think part of the reason is that domestic pension funds have have invested very heavily in gilts, partly de they think it's sort of de-risking their portfolios or their outcomes. And um, and it doesn't seem to be any kind of domestic um uh, domestic uh, push behind behind UK equities and a lot of private investors have gone very global as well. So I think the result is we've seen a lot of takeover bids for UK companies from mixture of private equity firms and overseas companies. I mean, in City of London, we had Morrison's, which was taken over by a private equity group in Bruin Dolphin, which was taken over by Royal Bank of Canada and the Daily Mail in general, which Lord Rothmere took private, but there are many other takeover bids. And I would see that trend continuing if the UK remains at such a discount. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of um, how I view the outlook, I mean, I think that inflation is beginning to come down, partly because these energy increases get timed out after 12 months. And so, you know, we, we peaked at, I think, uh, something close to 11%, and we're now 8.7%. But UK inflation has proved to be quite sticky. I mean, it will come down further, but wage growth is now, um, you have the second order effects of wages, and wage growth is now, got up to seven percent so uh, people's expectations of interest rates have changed and i'm be i'm very i think it's very likely we'll get another 25 basis point cut uh, increase from the bank of england tomorrow at their meeting and um you know the bank of england has to continue putting the brakes on to slow down uh wages and to get inflation under control so uh and uk's inflation at the moment is worse than uh, most of the other leading countries, but we should kind of fall back into line in the pack, I, I believe, um, as these energy increases come out of the picture. But uh, but overall, you know, the Fed uh, is has been increasing rates in America. They've just indicated they might have another one or two rate increases to go. The ECB increase in Europe increased rates last week. So, you know, it's not an easy um, picture with um, uh, interest and also they're they're reversing all the bond purchases they did so um that's not a particularly easy picture for, for markets and um in addition um i talk about the chinese reopening that's actually when i wrote that slide uh, that's kind of petering out a bit the chinese reopening has been a bit disappointing in terms of the sort of growth of the chinese economy so you know i don't think it's a particularly easy um outlook for kind of companies at the moment and um so overall you know, our gearing's at 7%, which is kind of um, at the lower end of our range. I mean, in terms of valuation, the PE, which is about one of the basic measures of um, measuring the market, is actually below the long-term average, so that ticks one box. And in terms of dividend yield, equities don't have the big premium they had over fixed interest, which is second chart on the right shows you, um, for many years when we had rock-bottom interest rates. But they're still yielding similar to what 10-year um, gilts, 30-year gilts, and... Um, base rates are, yet you've still got dividend growth from equities. So I, I would regard it, that's another tick in the box. So I think the valuation is is fine, but um, but there are some pressures out there. So um, probably sort of cautious approach overall, would I would suggest. Next slide. Uh, so in terms of Citi's portfolio, we have 88 holdings. That's slightly up on where we were a year ago or two years ago, um, when we down to 82. Um, but we have been higher in the past. I mean, by increasing the number of holders, it gives me a chance to get a bit more exposure to medium-sized companies. But I would see the range as being kind of around 85 to 90, whereby you want to make each holding count. But obviously, 
you do need the liquidity with but it's a two billion pound fund for the medium-sized companies we are of course predominantly large cap and that's always been our, our kind of um where we are placed in the market you should see us as that but we can we're 75 percent FTSE but you know we have at the moment we're quite low in non-FTSE only 10 percent uh but we have got scope we could I mean, five years ago, we were at 16%. So we could can to move that up a bit if, if when we see the opportunities. Um, we have some overseas listed. We'll never be more than 20% overseas listed, but we're at 15. But we've got some very interesting companies, but you don't find the equivalent in the UK, like, like Microsoft, which we've owned for 10 years and been extremely successful. In terms of the industry grouping, we've got two really big industry groupings. Financials is the first one. It's a mixture of banks, insurance, and financial services. Um, and... Um, that's our biggest single weighting. We think, you know, financial services something or financial something UK does well, and um, there's some very attractive dividend yields in that area. And um, and it, so we've got about a quarter of the portfolio in financial services and banks and insurers. Um, the, the next biggest um, weighting is consumer staples. These are the make of everyday products. Um, so we've got BA Tobacco, Unilever um, is a big holding here, Diageo as well. Um, uh, so. Um, that's another important set. So those are the two biggest um, kind of sector weightings. Consumer staples tend to be multinational companies, very solid, they don't cut their dividends. So they're a very good kind of building block for a income portfolio. Um, then our next biggest uh, weighting is industrials at 11%. We've got some very good UK industrial companies in that part of the portfolio, but our biggest is BA Systems, which is not only our biggest defense contract, their biggest business actually in the US where they're um, the the, the fifth, sixth biggest defense contractor in the US, and but they've also got a growing business to countries in Europe and to Japan and Australia. They've been picking up, a, they've got a massive order book, they've been picking up orders. I mean, obviously, the whole climate for defense spending's changed. We were, you know, we used to be in the kind of post Cold War peace, war, peace dividend, and that's now changed completely with the war in Ukraine. And companies, the countries' attitudes to defense spending has changed a lot. So, so BA is. It's a very good company with lo loads of good technology and um, and it's also been executing a lot better in recent years under its current management team. So um, so we like that one a lot. And then energy, we've got, um, and it shells our biggest, we're, we're technically underweight against index and shell, but we have got, a, I was a bit cross when they cut their dividend during the pandemic for the first time since the Second World War, but, but we have got some shell and um, BP and we've also got Total, which is the French international company which didn't cut its dividend. Healthcare, um, We've got 8%, it's so our fifth biggest sector. AstraZeneca is our biggest holding great company. I've at times had issues with the valuation and, and accounting, I've, but I've really been wrong because they've really come through with incredible um, discoveries in the cancer field. Um, so, uh, you know, it's actually the biggest, we are underweight. It's the biggest stock by market cap in the UK. And it, so it has um, done extremely well, but it's a top 10 holding for us. Next slide, please. Uh, so this just actually shows you how the UK, how the City of London portfolio is um, is spread in terms of the revenue or sales of the companies we're invested in and drilling down and seeing where all that sales come from. And actually, you can see it's very global. I mean, 68% of the sales comes from outside the UK, uh, only 32% in the UK. So you're really getting a, a good mix of global exposure, you know, Europe, Asia Pacific, US, of course, and, um, and emerging markets. Um, and I would say you're getting all that exposure, global exposure at a UK stock market discount rating. Next slide, please. So the top 10 holdings um, at the end of April, and um, you can see we've got four consumer staples stocks in the top 10, BATS, um, BA Tobacco, that is Diageo, Unilever, Imperial. And we've got two old companies, Shell and BP, but you've also got a couple of lower yielding companies for more like growth, which is Diageo and, and Relics, um, the information uh, supplier. Um, and um, I mean, HSB sees our biggest bank, but we are underweight in that one, but it has started performing a lot better recently. Um, so the top 10 make up 32%, it's not overly concentrated. Um, the next 10 down, please, next slide. Uh, so the next slide, um, shows you that the next 10 down and um here we got a lot of our kind of financials i think there are six financials um here phoenix at number 12 was a life company mg's a mixture of kind of life and fund manager very interesting yield there um three eyes and invest in private companies done very well over the last 12 months got a incredibly successful investment and discount retail in europe called action 
Um, and then we've got St. James's Place in kind of insurance and financial advice, and then Lloyd's and Legal and General, Lloyd's being obviously you know, and Legal and General and life companies. So, you know, quite quite heavy presence in, in our kind of top 20. As you can see, we've got two utilities, National Grid and SSE, and both are very well positioned to benefit from the electrification of the economy. I mean, National Grid is actually almost 50% in the US, but obviously they are tilted towards electricity transmission and that and there's a lot of going to be a huge need to kind of grow that um increased investment in that area and then SSE is the UK's biggest producer of renewable energy the biggest wind farm producer offshore wind farms and also hydroelectric um so two two very interesting companies so the, the next this second top 10 or the sort of the 11 to 20 makes up 21 percent so the top the top um uh the, the top 20 make up around um, 53% of, of the portfolio. So not overly concentrated, but these stocks will, will surely have an impact. So, so next slide, please. So really to sum up, um, it's um, 56 years of annual dividend increase, which is the longest record of any investment trust. As I said before, we, it, we needed a portfolio, a core of portfolio, consistent companies, quality companies, but we could never achieve that without the investment trust investment trust structure, that ability to um, use revenue reserves, put the money into the reserve in the good years and then draw down from it in the bad years. That's been critical. We could never have achieved the 56 years without that. Uh, very low charges, 0.37% ongoing charge ratio, including the management fee, lowest in our sector, and way lowest than you, than you find in an open-ended um, company, courtesy of the independent board directors. And then uh, longer term outperformance of FTSE All Share, I hope I've explained bit about my conservative investment style. We're not going to outperform every year, but in the long run, it has delivered outperformance for our shareholders. So at this point, um, I think I'll, I'll pause and um, throw it open to any questions. Thanks very much, Joe, for a very interesting presentation and congratulations on such an excellent uh, long-term performance. That's very Thank good to, to see. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we, we have a few questions, I'm pleased to say. Uh, so we'll start with uh, Roy's question at the top. Um, so he's asking, what's your secret of trading so regularly at a premium? Other big trusts like Foreign and Colonial and Witan are at significant discounts, despite showing good performance in the AIC uh, tables. Yes, uh, I think that uh, overall, you know, what we're offering, which is sort of dividend yield, and growth is, is very appealing for a lot of people. I mean, I think that, you know, a lo lot of people are close to retirement or in retirement and, um, you know, they need a regular dividend, you know, to pay their bills. And and so we're, our, our dividend yield is somewhat higher than, than Whitson and Foreign Colonial, and which, are, you know, I mean, we're yielding around close to 5% at the moment. So that combination of the yield dividend, which is paid quarterly, and the growth, plus the good long-term track record um, and the low charges, I think, you know, it does appeal to a lot of people out there. Um, but, you know, obviously, you know, we, we are kind of UK focused, you know, and obviously, as I said, and when I was talking, if you drill down, the companies are quite quite global. The UK stock market does not equal the UK economy. And we've also got our 15% in overseas listed. But, but you know, we are UK, we're kind of value and income conservative. They're going to be in anyone's portfolio, you're going to want other trusts. You're going to, you're surely going to want some global trusts. You may want some growth trusts, et cetera. So it depends on, you know, what your attitude is to what you're looking for in terms of growth and income, et cetera. But I, I think there is certainly a big constituency out there. You know, our, our kind of um, what we're offering does does appeal to people. Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, some further evidence that combination of dividends and growth appealing another trust uh, with similar um, characteristics, JP Morgan Global Growth also yeah. tends to trade at a premium consistently. Yes. And yep. it's because they pay a consistent dividend too. So, and yeah, and your 56 year track record <laughs> certainly helps in terms of investor sentiment towards the, the trusts. Good. Um, so next, a uh, simple question from Andrew. Do the majority of the team own shares in the trust? Uh, I I can't, I mean, David Smith owns, has a holding. I mean, I have a holding worth about 1.2 million pounds and that's declared in the annual report. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, so you know each year you can check it but it's um but now i'm very comfortable you know with it uh, you know very happy to earn it you know it's my biggest 
holding. So um, as you can imagine, I'm, I'm, so I'm kind of eating my own cooking. If this only go to restaurants for the chefs eat their own cooking, so I'm, I'm certainly eating my own cooking. That's, uh, that's very, <laughs> very good to hear. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Okay, and then uh, on to, to Matthew. Um, do you think that the high yield of legal and general and Phoenix um, are sustainable? Um, eight and a half percent for LNG and 9.4 for, for Phoenix? Yeah, I mean, it's an extremely good question. When you mm. see those sort of dividend yields that people do sort of question that, you know, I mean, there's a kind of area when you get on to very high yields, it's a sign that them people sort of lack credibility because in a way it's illogical. Why, why should they yield that much? You'd have thought, um, uh, you'd have thought that, um, you know, if they're sustainable, they should be on a lower yield. I think, I think life companies are very complex beasts. I mean, you're dealing with, um, you know, they're writing life policies going out sometimes for decades um, and um, and they're backing that up with capital. And it, you know, it is, it's, and accounting is extremely complex. Um, and, and I think there's just a sort of people, a lot of investors view them as a, a black box and um, impossible to kind of understand. Um, and it's not helped by the accounting, they're about to change accounting yet again and look at it in a different way. So, um, so I think it's, you know, people have been very put off by the sector, but, um, you know, but I've personally, I've, I've looked at Phoenix, I mean, they've specialised in, in scooping up kind of closed books, which are kind of the old life companies which have kind of shut themselves to new business. Um, and, um, and they've got a kind of a big portfolio with policies maturing over the next 15 years and kind of Phoenix has bought a lot of these policies, including Standard Life's, um, which was a huge business um, policies, and um, and bundled them all together. And a lot of efficiencies by kind of putting them all together. And these these um, policies do throw off cash over over time. Um, you know, as as people, because you have to set aside sort of extra capital against each policy. But as a policy matures, you know, if nothing's gone wrong, then it throws off a bit of capital for for the shareholders. So, you know, under pretty conservative um, uh, calculations these these policies throw off a lot of cash which completely supports the dividend over future years but in addition when they bought the standard life business they also bought um a kind of open book of business which is actually selling new new policies so they are actually now beginning to kind of grow their book in addition to um uh in addition to having this sort of big back book so uh, so i think it's got even better so i think it's um you know, somewhat illogical, you know, the sh share price and, um, but you just have to be patient, but, but, um, you know, there's old saying you're paid while you wait with, with it, you know, so you, you know, actually a 9%, you know, yield is on its own is, is a pretty good return. Most people would expect equities in the long run to, to return about 7%. And that's a mixture of capital and income. So if you can kind of, if that 9% yield is safe then it, it will be a very good return in, in the long run. Um, but, and then legal in general, um, is, um, it, it's really kind of it's, it's got a huge business in in annuities and it and um it, it takes our off pension funds off from companies and um mm. and sort of de-risks them and and uh and it's got a huge business in, in this area um which um they're the biggest in in the uk and they've expanded internationally and and they're kind of backing these um deals off against you know corporate bonds etc so um you know, again, it's, it's very similar to Phoenix. People sort of, in terms of investor perception, people feel it's a black box. You know, people got concerned during the first part of COVID that they, you know, they would be in danger. A lot of the kind of comp companies where they buy the bonds defaulted. Um, but actually, they've proved to have a very um, a good track record. They run it very conservatively, and they've had very good experience in their on their credit side. So, uh, and they 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 take on these um, uh, pensions that they um uh that they that on very conservative basis and so um so i have to say um you've had a mixture of a very high yield and dividend growth from that company and they didn't like phoenix both companies carried on paying the dividends during that first period of the COVID. do you remember when the banks were prevented the banking stopped them paying their dividends and a load of companies cut their dividends including mm -hmm. shell as i mentioned earlier and and various other companies paused their dividends but actually phoenix and eagle in general carried on by growing the business and actually I wasn't I was in Phoenix already at that point but I wasn't in legal in general and I bought into them I felt because they were the shares created and they were on a, a ridiculous yield and um even higher than they are are today so they want a yield of 12 or something and um and I bought I started City of London's holding at that point uh so I I think they're kind of well City of London I mean they're 
within the portfolio, I've got certain shares that are in there to kind of provide dividend yield and other ones which are kind of more about capital appreciation. And, and this, these were certainly in the dividend bucket. But it, you know, in the very long run, I think, you know, if they could continue paying these dividends and in the case of the Eagles, and you're getting some dividend growth for Phoenix as well. Um, and Phoenix has a chance as they do more bolt-on deals to that to grow that grow their business further um, and their dividend further. So, you know, I think they're they're difficult, complicated stocks. Um, you know, they're not certainly you wouldn't want to have all your savings in each one of them as an investment. I wouldn't recommend that at all. But but as part of our portfolio of 88 stocks, um, you know, I I like them. Um, they they're providing me with a very attractive yield. I mean, I have to, you know, you can never say never on things. And, you know, I have, to, I have to watch these things very closely, and I'm helped by the analysts I have at Janice Henderson um, and our regular meetings with, with the companies. We've met them both many times over the years. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I'm 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 comfortable with them for, for City of London, but it's it is a good question. Yeah, and, and I mean, I, I very much uh, agree with your comment. I, I tend to steer clear of the life assurers for precisely the reasons you said that they're they're difficult and and suffer from the law of large numbers that. There, if you look at them on an NAV basis, uh, they have very large assets, very large liabilities. So it only yeah. needs a small change in either of those to to completely alter the the NAV. I think uh, to be fair, hmm. they are much more conservatively regulated than they were going back. Yes. I mean, I think yes. they were. If you go back, I can remember in the bear market of 2000, 2003, they entered that, which was kind of post the TMT bubble, and they entered that with much too much sort of leverage and much too much exposure to equities and um and they had a torrid time and they ended up um because some of them kind of were in danger of you know putting their polytotals into danger end up having to sell equities kind of at the bottom of that bear market it was sort of terrible and um and since then they've been much more tightly regulated so actually they came through the financial crisis relatively well compared to the banks and during the as i said during the recent uh, well, that kind of very sharp bear market we had a very very brief one in the beginning of the pandemic, they they sailed for it in terms of not having to cut their, their share price for hit, but they didn't have to cut their dividends, which was which was very encouraging. Certainly a, a good sign. As as you say, you've really got to do the work with with those sort of investments and uh, and and keep a very close eye on on how they develop. Good. Um, so uh, next, uh, David Wolf is asking if there's a, a succession plan for your eventual retirement, which I'm sure your, your shareholders I hope doesn't come particularly soon. Oh, so, can you say? But if well, you David, have different views yourself. Uh, David Smith is um, obviously he is my deputy, and we've worked together for ten years. He's been official deputy on the trust for the last two years, and he attends all the board meetings. And you know, I sit next to him. We work very close together, and he's certainly our, you know, he's our desired candidate or Janice Henson's mm -hmm. desired candidate to, to be my successor and and I think the board he's well liked and respected by the board but I think the decision will be taken you know when I when I do choose choose to retire but at the moment I'm you know I am in, enjoying it a lot and um the challenge and um you know I I I feel I feel a bit too young to retire you know I I, <laughs> I don't feel that older but the only th sign of age is when I'm about age 50 I had to take reading glasses but that's you know I feel roughly the same as I did to be honest but but you know who knows if your health you know if I suffer health issues or whatever I mean so there is certainly if something suddenly happened to me I had a terrible heart attack or something then David is there you know he he could take over the portfolio immediately um but so there is there's that side of being a success having a session plan but uh, but I'm hoping to go on for a few more years for sure I mean I am enjoying it and um I seem to have I don't know I seem to have endless bills at home, you know. So you you think you're <laughs> you think you're through it, but you know, even even your children get into their twenties, you're still sort of having to yeah, fund things, etc. Yeah. So um, it, you know, it doesn't seem to end. But I I, I think um, you know, I, I find the stock market fascinating, and I, I also really enjoy the colleagues I work with in the team I work work with, Janice Henderson. So um, you know, I'm I'm very happy to carry on working at the moment. Good, good. As long as you're enjoying it, that's the key thing. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so um, there's a few questions from Stephen Mitchell. Um, first of all, uh, he's asking about any uh, mid cap holdings that uh, the, the trust has. Yes, I mean we've um, got various mid cap holdings. I mean it's only ten percent of, of the portfolio, but um, you know one quite interesting one is IG Group, which is a spread betting yes. um, company. Um, which um, you know, a lot of people, you know, enables people in private investors to sort of bet on shares falling 
uh, and indices falling. And they, they do a massive range of indices. They've, they were established in the UK by Stuart Wheeler many years ago. Um, and um, then they floated on the stock market, but they've recently they've built it overseas a bit as well. And they've also built, bought a business in the US. And, and that one looks um, very good value to me. The great advantage, when the market, when you get market turbulence, they do very well, because then people still want to bet on, Ooh. take views when it's volatility. So um, so it's kind of a bit like, a, actually funny enough, the shares of IG don't necessarily reflect that at the time, but it, it right. does some, um, it's like a, it's a bit of a put option within the portfolio. I know there's a bit of turbulence when, when some of my other shares may not be doing so well, IG will be, be doing well. I mean, I've actually got IMI, I've had it for many years, which is sort of specialist engineer, which um, is actually just about to be promoted in the FTSE 100. Mm -hmm. um, I've got Rathbones, which is um, the, the private account wealth management group. I mentioned Bruin Dolphin got taken over and Rathbones, I replaced it with Rathbones and they've actually, actually did, done a deal with Investex. So they're kind of merging with them um, be kind of the be, be, the, be the largest um, UK private account wealth manager. That's a great, good growth growth area. Um, I've got Britvic, which um, uh, is a Pepsi Cola bottler in, in the UK um, and also does various um, soft drinks as well. Interesting company. Tate and Lyre, which is, used to be sugar and uh, it's actually gone, got, gone away from its commodity side. It's now predominantly um, uh, sort of ingredients, the clever ingredients in food, which make make it sort of taste of something without um, it actually being there. So it's quite a good quality um, uh, company there mer merging. So uh, yeah, so I have got a, a range of the, the position sizes tend to be smaller than than in the lot. You know, there's none of them in the top twenty as as you saw. Um, but um, but it's it's certainly as you probably know, the mid cap has underperformed. We did underperform very badly last year as a small cap. So you know, I have got my, um, it's an area I've been looking to buy more into. I've bought recently, more recently Vesuvius uh, in the, and Morgan Crucible, um, uh, so it, uh, sorry, Morgan Advanced Materials, these people, Morgan Crucible in, in the engineering I sector, which I think are two companies which are much better companies than the, those are two classic companies, which if they were in, you know, if they were on the US stock market would have a kind of rating 50% higher than they are in the UK. They're much better companies than the rating would suggest a bit cyclical. I have got a bit of, Building exposure. I've got Ibstock, which is Britain's um, biggest brick maker. Obviously, suffering, going to suffer a bit at the moment. Um, but you know, very interesting longer term. I think we need more houses in the UK, and you know, they're going kind to of well positioned there. And then I've got Marshalls, which does paving stones, and also bought the Marley Roof business, which is the biggest roof tile business in the UK. So those two are kind of a bit like sleepers. They're kind of um, they're going to they're going to suffer at the moment with the housing market, but you know, you never get in. Well, you have to be very clever to sort of buy them at the bottom. So I, I'm going to sit it out with them. And I think they'll, they've already shares have underperformed and um, they've come off a lot. So I think they'll do very well. Um, the market, the stock market always looks ahead. So when the market anticipates it, where the feels we're at the top of the interest rate cycle and begins to anticipate interest rates falling again and housing market picking up, these stocks will will really go well and um uh, but it's a difficult it's always very difficult this moment because at the moment their profits and sales will be under pressure and you know i'm hoping their dividends won't be under pressure but they might be so it's um so i'm not adding to them at the moment but i'm sort of sticking with them and um and i think i'm I, eventually they bet they've got reason to be web well, has got reason to be good balance sheet um so that's something to watch with the sickle stocks generally i mean in chemicals there's been some profit warnings we've got some victrex which has had a profit warning. Um, but um, again, this is a good quality company with a strong balance sheet. So, uh, you know, often by the time the profit warnings happened, it, you know, it may not perform in the short term, but it'll be reflecting a lot of bad news, discounting it. And if you can, if you can be patient enough, you know, there's long-term value there, which when you'll benefit from, you know, from the recovery. That gives you a flavor of, so the overall it's, it's 10%, you know, obviously the big positions are large cap. And we've got some big overseas listed ones, but but you know I think there's value emerging there. So it's a question of um, finding you know the right stocks. I mean I you, I don't I don't want to kind of buy into something which can has a profit warning and a dividend cut. So it's it's a mixed you know. But I'm I'm sort of like a fisherman trawling out there for for ideas and um and doing doing a lot of work in that area with David and and the rest of the team. Good. Yeah, uh, yeah. Ig is one I also hold. But, uh, share your your enthusiasm for that uh, that company. Um, 
Roy Kilbrown asks, um, how much exposure does the trust have to China and uh, does that concern you? Yeah, I, have, I mean, I've had been worried about the politics in in China, you know, for a long time. And and that's why I mean, HSBC, there are two kind of UK listed banks, which are, are, are very focused on China and that region. And one is HSBC, the other is Standard Chartered. We don't hold Standard Chartered. HSBC, we have got a decent holding in, but we are quite underweight relative to the index. But it is at the moment, I mean, HSBC, I mean, the banks in general are benefiting from rising interest rates, provided we don't tip into a sort of big recession. If they get a big recession, they get the impairments and the loan losses, and that's not good for them. But the moment they're able to kind of price their spread between what they pay depositors and what they pay borrowers much more easily than they have been when we had ultra low interest rates. And we've really seen that HSBC, where the which is Hong Kong's their main biggest business and they're predominantly in Asia Pacific and they've really benefited from, from the rise in US interest rates. So we're getting a very attractive dividend flow from HSBC and it's not it's not expensively rated relative to its tangible book value, you know, given its level of profitability at the moment. So we have got some exposure to to um uh to HSBC but underweight. I mean we we're underweight mining. I mean mining is a sector that it's quite dependent on China um, and particularly iron ore. And we, we previously had both BHP and Rio Tinto. BHP was 50% listed in UK, 50% in Australia. They've now moved their whole listing to Australia. And they did that about a year and a half ago because they're getting a better rating out there. That's another feature of the UK's um, per hour status at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and I've actually recently sold out of BHP um, because it's very exposed to iron ore and the iron ore is totally dependent on Chinese demand uh, for steel making and infrastructure. And there's certainly still real signs with the Chinese property market that's petering out a bit. We still got that exposure with Rio Tinto, but I didn't want to have double with BHP. And I've actually switched into Glencore, which is in fact a lot more um, out of BHP, much more exposed to uh, some of the kind of metals benefiting the energy transition like um, like copper, they got 37% earnings come from, come from copper, going to need a lot of copper going forward. So, uh, so um, I've, I've, got, I've only got one of, uh, investment in the region, um, which is in Hong Kong. I own Spa Pacific, which is actually really a British company. It's, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's owned by the Spa family, or controlled by us who, are, uh, who, who are basically, who live in England. Um, but they've been, and they're one of the old Hongs in Hong Kong, and they've been in Hong Kong for for over a century, and they've got a. It's actually incredibly cheap. I mean, they've they own um 85 percent of Spa Pacific, and they also own 42 percent of Cafe Pacific. And if you throw in those this value of those two stakes, I mean, the Spa Pacific shareholding is is it covers the whole of Spa Pacific shareholding. At the same time, they're the biggest bottler for Coca Cola across across Asia Pacific, um, with um, uh, in places like China and in the and in some states in America so um it, it's kind of family controlled it's not on any index anymore so it's kind of um but it's got a five or close to five percent dividend yield looks very interesting so I feel and it's very conservatively managed with low levels of debt so I, I feel that's a kind of value way contrarian way of paying playing the region but you know for all one, one's worries about China the region has terrific growth much better growth than um uh, than we've got in Europe or um, possibly in the US so um so it's it's a sort of difficult balancing act, um, but it is, you know, what one is um, aware of the tensions with China and, and the difficulties there. Right, thank you. Um, there's one question's just uh, come in. Sorry, I'll just, just pull that one up, uh, which was submitted uh, previously. Uh, let me just uh, check what it's... Uh, I mean, the, the question's already been answered. Sorry, I'll come back to the the list we have here. It was about the succession issue, which uh, you've you've answered fully already. Um, right. So Stephen Mitchell asks, uh, could you say more about the fifteen percent overseas exposure? I mean, partly you answered that in the in the last question, but I don't know if are there other overseas yes. holdings that you'd like to mention. Um, yeah, no, definitely. I mean. As I mentioned, I was very disappointed when Shell um, cut its dividend by two thirds in in the first 2020, and BP cut by 50 percent. And but the French um, oil company Total didn't. They'd actually manned themselves rather better. Had came into it with lower debt, and they didn't cut their dividend. So I 
I, I switched some of the shareholding into Total, so which was the right thing to have done, because if I just sold Shell, I mean, actually Shell has recovered quite well from that point, and um, it would be a bit like cutting your nose off to spite your face. And uh, um, so, uh, but, but by switching into Total, I kept retain the exposure to oil, um, but had continued to have a better dividend. Um, I've also got Woodside, which um, is Australian, so that spun out of BHP, and is particularly big in LNG. It's 50% to LNG, and I think LNG is it's got a in the energy transition has got a big, big, big part to play because um, um, you know because renewable energy is interruptible, and we still need fossil fuel to keep the lights on on cold, dark nights. So um, so uh, so I think Woodside's very, very well placed for that. Um, in pharmaceuticals, um, I mentioned that I like pharmaceuticals in general. It's it's a very it's a sector that you know in a downturn does very well. People you know health spending carries on. These companies very cash generative, um, good quality business, and, and they're not expensive rated. Uh, but I found AstraZeneca going back some of the accounting um, a bit tricky, and uh, yeah. and so I actually bought a holding in Merck of the US as a German. Mm -hmm. I had the US one, which actually has also done very well in the cancer field, in the immunotherapy, mm -hmm. which is where you're using your own body to sort of attack cancer, and um, they're actually the leader in that in America and globally. Um, and I've also got some very high qualities in for companies in that area. I've got Johnson & Johnson, which with Microsoft is the one of any, the only two companies globally which are still triple A rated for, for, for debt. And they've grown their dividend longer than the city of London since 1956, in fact. So that's a good dividend aristocrat. So it's a good one for us to hold. Um, I've also got Novartis, the Swiss um, pharmaceutical giant, and Sanofi, which is French, uh, but global. And um, so I quite like the pharma sector. And that's been there rather than if you've just um, stuck to UK, you'd only have AstraZeneca, which admittedly has done quite well, and Glaxo, Smith Time, which has been pretty disappointing. And mm -hmm. uh, but by having uh, a spread, you know, that's kind of um, less meant I've been sort of less focused on just two companies. I've mentioned Microsoft. I have taken a few profits of Microsoft wrongly, of course, but it, it's gone up over 10 times since I bought it. And, um, you know, it's a remarkable company um, and it's seen now to be at the forefront of artificial intelligence. That's mm -hmm. why it's had this next leg upwards, which I didn't quite foresee. But um, but they've been brilliant at moving into the cloud where with Amazon, they're the two one of the two big players in, in the cloud, as well as kind of doing all the kind of mm -hmm. software and RPCs, et cetera, which continues to chug along. So, you know, that's that's another example. Um, so. Uh, so those are, I've got less in financials, you know, to be honest, I quite like the British financial, I've got a bit of Munich Ray, the German reinsurer, but I haven't got any um, foreign banks or, or any other foreign financial companies. Um, I have got some Siemens, had them for a while um, in, in engineering. Good, I think that's an, been performing a lot better. I've also got Wholesome in building materials because I've got, um, I've got Marshalls and Ibstock. They're very much domestic, whilst Wholesome is a sort of global player in, in cement and in, and ready mix concrete and been very well managed. It's much liked by um, colleagues on our European team. So um, mm -hmm. so I've got that one. So I think it's, it tends to be either stocks where it's offering something you can't find in the UK, like a Microsoft, or it's um, and I've got another in the so I've got the um, French national lottery um, uh, operator called La Française Déjà, which um, which I bought it on its privatization in the nineteen uh, twenty nineteen, and that's some. Um, done well and um that skin there's no equivalent you can find in the uk uh, mm -hmm. so it's either kind of unique type of stocks or it's stocks just giving me a, a bit of extra diversification in sectors like pharma or oil and or not just being purely having shell and bp that just gives you some extra scope there so so th those would be the two criteria but it, as i said we we want to stay in the uk equity income sector we're very pleased to be in the uk's cheap so it's not it's not going to go above 20 percent. it's currently 15 percent or so and um and, and it will stick at that kind of level i would expect yeah and stephen also asked in that question do, do you hedge do you currency hedge those uh, overseas holdings um we don't really i mean i think um it tends currency tends to kind of wash in and out you know i mean you what you get looking across the whole portfolio and you know if the pound goes down you know obviously our, our benefit um you know overall from kind of overseas revenues and, and dividends but but there will be some losers. Some of the domestic stocks will will suffer, you know, cost increases. Um, if it goes the, the other way, you know, it'll be better for other parts of the portfolio. I think currencies are very difficult to predict, um, and I think, um, but over over time, you know, the pound has gone down really, and so, um, you know, I think it could be 
a bit dangerous. I think part of the appeal of being in equity is to say relative to being in a kind of your bank deposit account or being in British bonds is that you actually do get some foreign currency exposure. And I think, you know, over most of our careers, the pound has gone down. Of course, it did bottom uh, during Liz Truss's premiership at 107 yeah. against US dollar. It's now 127. So admittedly, if you'd had the nerve back in September to hedge, it would have been a quite a successful policy. But I think, um, I, I mean, it was a big change on the night of the referendum in 2000, literally in you know, 2000, yes. June 2016, which is um, what seven years ago, the yeah. pound fell from 150, but went through white or 148, I think, on the eve, and it crashed. And I think it's not actually made made it above 140 since. You know, so that was an interesting kind of um, mm -hmm. um, move in markets. You know, it was quite a big big move in the in in the markets um, at that point, and it it seems to have been stuck overall and against the US dollar in a kind of range of between kind of 120 and 140 since that since that period since the referendum and you know I have to say the UK economic fundamentals to be honest don't look as good as well they look better than say the US at the moment so it's quite hard to see it um the US has got some issues as well of course but um but you know the overall strength of the US economy etc you know um you probably want to you wouldn't want to be too short of the US dollar I wonder for in my, my view Hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think we've got time, if, if you're uh, happy with that, Job, for a couple more questions, sure. and uh, then I think that, that'll take us up to the, the hour pretty much. Um, so, uh, yeah, another interesting question from, from Stephen, uh, something that ShareSock has been uh, working on, looking at various consultations, in that um, the, the government has been looking at various mechanisms that might make uh, UK stocks more attractive to hold for, for UK pension funds. Um, do you think they're actually going to do anything? And uh, what 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 um, do you think would be sensible for them to do to, to, yeah. to achieve that objective? That's a difficult question. I mean, I think, um, yeah, I think, I mean, UK pension funds, I think it's more about a lot of them just want to de-risk to say to find benefit schemes. You know, most of them are now closed to new new members. They've just got a set members to service and they just want to kind of de-risk it and put it against fixed interest I don't think a lot's going to be changed in that sense and I mean it's also a bit sad I saw the every weekend the BT pension fund has got almost nothing in UK equities I mean it's got mm. it's got very little in equities it's our biggest pension fund I think but it's got almost nothing in equities but mm. it's predominantly in lot it's gone very global so, and the UK index is now only like five percent of the global index so they're kind of like that they're, they're and I think a lot of people are following that to, to be, be fair um uh, so I don't know. I don't think there's a single uh, golden bullet that you know that, that's out there. I mean, I think for some, you know, if you're a technology company, I mean, the U.S. is a bigger pool of investors. You know, I mean, they are that's they are particularly yes. good at technology investing. I mean, they are, you know, they you know the people they've got a huge specialization. They've got so many entrepreneurial companies, and and they're kind of not afraid to lose money. Um, you know, mm. which you have they're not. You know, but particularly for backing early stage technology, you're going to lose money on quite a few things as well as make a lot of money on others. So um, it's it's difficult to, I, I don't have any magic solution. I mean, sometimes people say you should, I mean, I suppose there is a case for, you know, one of the features in the UK is we, we like um, companies not to have kind of non-voting votes, shares, you know, where, mm -hmm. whereby, um, <clears throat> and so everybody, all shares get equal votes. Whilst actually often entrepreneurs set up a company want to retain control, and the US have been, you know, been more lenient now in those sort of companies to list and become part of their indices. I mean, we actually in City have held, we held Daily Mail, which was kind of largely family controlled, and that was was a good good share for us. And Schroder's, funnily enough, which we mm. financial group, which we we've held, and we had the non-voting shares, <coughs> which yeah. traded at a big discount, like twenty five percent to the voters, but got the same dividend. And then um, I must say, somewhat to my surprise, they were enfranchised. So we had a big uplift. I mean, we didn't get the equivalent of the voting shares, but we got almost, we got, we we, we, we were converted at a 5% discount. So, I mean, there's something to be said, I think, to allowing, in general, I like it, a one share, one vote system, but I can see that London might become more attractive to entrepreneurs if 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 they allowed um, entrepreneurs a bit more control, you know, founders of companies. I mean, it's going to be a bit off-putting if they, First of all, they're not allowed non-voting shares. And then they're under our system, which we follow rigorously on City of London, board directors are supposed to retire after nine years. So if you tell an entrepreneur listing his company uh, on London Stock Exchange, you can't have non-voting shares. And then, by the way, you're going to have to 
resign from the board in nine years time it's not <laughs> particularly mm -hmm. appealing I don't think so uh so I think um uh, and they're obviously working on it and I I know it's been taken very seriously the government's very important for the country that we attract companies into London um uh so, but it's not an easy one to answer to be honest no, that's that's very true. Um, I mean, the the, the nine year issue, I, I believe, only applies to non executives. So, oh, yeah, that's, point. Were, yeah. Were executive, <clears throat> that's a good that point. Be an issue. It, it it is, yeah. It's it's concerning that uh, you know if you have these dual dual share classes that uh, it, it does raise questions about the governance of the company. You know whether there's uh, one dominant person which well this is something i really tend to avoid yeah. yeah no it's a very good point i mean that's um, yeah. <clears throat> i mean i'm only thinking of things they might do but um, i might quite like one share one vote in general but sometimes family control companies do i mean swaz is family control they yes. can take a longer term view yes. you know to be fair yeah you have okay. to be know what you who you're dealing with i think it's probably, yeah quite quite i mean schroeder's has been very well managed in the long run yeah yeah good and then so final question um, what excites you most about UK stocks in the portfolio right now? Um, UK is so out of favour post Brexit. When, when... I think it's just the cheap, relative cheapness of the UK market. I, mean, I think it's some, um, you know, particularly like me, you're looking for both income and capital return. And, um, you know, our shares just these discount ratings compared to the kind of foreign shares. Some, um, I think, highly appealing. So, um, uh, you know, you might have to be patient, as I said earlier, that you are. While you're being patient, if you're in good quality companies, you're kind of paid a decent dividend as well. Which um, so I think um, uh, you know I think it's uh, particularly. Well, I have to say also with another thing is with a bit of inflation around, you know I mean I think fixed interest generally just is 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 not a good place to be when there's inflation. You know either um you know I mean obviously index linked has got some um, appeal, but 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 uh, conventional fixed interest or bank deposits, you know you are being eaten away in real terms um, when you've got inflation where it is at the moment whilst if you're invested in real assets in companies through the stock market you know you have got depending on what type of companies you're in you've got a degree of protection from inflation some of our companies have, have actually got a lot of protection can really um uh, uh, uh can really push through uh you know they're pretty unaffected by inflation so yes as long as long as they have pricing power then exactly then say that's, yeah. that's the key yeah Great. Well, well, thanks very much for, for all those uh, those answers, as well as the, the presentation. I think that made for a, for a very interesting session overall. So that's great, Job. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mark. And thank you, everyone, for listening.